Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of the Metabolism and Menopause podcast. My name is Stephanie, and I am your host and CEO of Vitality OET. We are a women's nutrition, health, and fitness company that focuses predominantly on women's hormones, particularly as they start going through perimenopause and onwards. We know that you start going through a lot of changes in this time of your life, whether that be hot flashes, night sweats, irritability, brain fog, or of course, that weight gain around the middle that seems to have come out of absolutely nowhere. So you go back to your tried and true methods of cutting calories, cutting carbs, doing a bunch of cardio, yet nothing seems to work. You are more exhausted. You are not sleeping well, and the scale might actually start moving in the other direction. But we know now that your body is inherently different now that you've experienced these hormonal changes. So our mission here at Vitality is to help you really understand how your body changes in this time of your life so you can live a life full of vitality, reach those health and fitness goals, feel in control and at home in your body again, and really understand how to take care of this new body of yours. So today I want to talk about bloating. I want to talk about digestion. I want to talk about fluid retention. And the hormones responsible for that, because bloating seems to be a very common topic that we're having in discussions right now with clients and just in DMs and consultation calls. Um, So I really want to dive into how hormones affect this because, again, people don't talk about this stuff, right? So we're going to cover how hormones affect digestion, bloating, fluid retention, and weight fluctuations, which I'm sure you're like, oh my gosh, yes, I want to need to know all those things. I'm experiencing changes. And... I've already touched on the last couple episodes in particular, a lot about how hormones really help, like really, what's the word looking for, can really influence your ability to lose weight. Um, And now we know that it's also going to affect your bloating, the number on the scale, because it can fluctuate a lot. Like for some women, including myself, especially when I was going through a lot of my progesterone troubles, I could fluctuate like five pounds in a day. So This is where it's really important to understand because it's going to help us not panic, but it's also going to help us be proactive to help improve all these things for you. So first, we're going to start with how hormones affect digestion, and then we're going to finish with weight fluctuations, the number on the scale um, in terms of hormones for you. So hormones that affect digestion, your brain, hormones, and nerves all team up to really direct digestion and how that functions for you. And they do this by sending messages between your brain and your digestive tract. The nerves in your gut recognize when food is passing through or even when you start chewing. So it starts getting things going for you. So it knows when to release certain digestive agents. It starts triggering triggering muscle contractions. So your bowels will contract and relax to help kind of move things through your digestive system. Um, It's going to really help push the food, push the food along. Um, So kind of like when my father-in-law did the worm at our wedding, (laughs) it's the same kind of thing. You're helping move everything through the digestive system. So digestion is a really well-oiled machine. That is unless hormone levels start to change, which we know for women, unfortunately, that happens a lot. Monthly cycles, right? So that can change bloating, digestion, things like that. And then of course, perimenopause and menopause. So let's go over all of the hormones that are going to influence our digestion the most. So the first one is progesterone and progesterone, like I've talked about, is that that hormone that just makes you feel relaxed, makes you feel grounded. You're not anxious. You're sleeping well. And if we're not experiencing those things, typically progesterone is not where it's supposed to be. But progesterone also plays a role in not just relaxation of like our mind and our body, but our digestive system as well. So it helps with the relaxation of smooth muscle, which is the kind of muscle that we actually have in our gut. So when progesterone is low, it can really prevent relaxation of your digestive tract, which can lead to constipation, bloating, gas, and pain. For myself right now, because I'm pregnant, progesterone levels are very high, highest I've ever had in my life. Um, That's what helps promote a healthy pregnancy and being able to maintain that pregnancy. But that also leads to a lot of relaxation in your, in your smooth muscle and in your gut. So for me, digestion is slow, not because of low progesterone, but now because progesterone is really high. So my muscles are too relaxed in my gut and things move very slowly. So that's progesterone. Then we have estrogen. So besides cortisol, estrogen is going to play the most crucial role when it comes to our gut health and our digestion, 
which typically surprises people, but it makes sense that we start having more issues with bloating and digestion as we start going through perimenopause and menopause and our estrogen levels start to go down. So not only do estrogens really help our body regulate its microbiome, so all the healthy gut bacteria that's in our gut, um, but estrogen receptors are present in our gut and can even produce estrogen in our gut. So when we have too much or too little estrogen, like the ups and downs that we start experiencing during perimenopause and menopause, um, we can have a subsequent crash of those hormones over time due to stress as well. So like if we're in a high stress state and progesterone tanks and estrogen starts to go down as well, we're going to see a lot of issues with our gut functioning as well. So our body just basically can't function as efficiently as it could before and digestion really takes a hit there. Um, so then our gut health is not going to be optimal and that can also affect estrogen production and regulation in the gut, which can also contribute to imbalances. So you can see how there's a more complicated relationship when it comes to hormones and gut health, but people don't talk about this stuff. Again, this is why we're trying to put this out there to teach you guys, because it's important to understand these things. And then you might have some little light bulb moments of, oh, that makes so much sense now. So slowing of the digestive tract can make it harder for your body to digest food efficiently. So this can cause more bloating throughout the day. Even when you wake up, it can contribute to the menopause belly when we feel distended. So it feels like our belly gets more bloated throughout the day, or it feels like um, our belly is like protruding more. This can be part of that too. The drop in estrogen can then also affect our microbiome and it's going to shift a little bit. And what that means is the bacteria in our gut becomes imbalanced for some time, which can lead to more digestive discomfort and lead to other issues down the road as well. Then we have testosterone. So testosterone doesn't have a direct effect on digestion the way progesterone and estrogen does. However, in adequate levels, it does help blunt the effects of our stress hormones on our gut. So this means that good testosterone levels will help us blunt that stress response and minimize the nerve impact stress can have on our digestive system. I'm going to get into that in a little bit right away here. But low testosterone levels have also been correlated with more constipation, meaning testosterone can play a role in your digestive tract mobility or motility, sorry. So how well your um, bowels can contract, like your, your intestines can contract to move food along to help you with the digestive system process, as well as any bloating and things like that as well. So while it doesn't have a direct role, it's definitely going to influence things. And again, testosterone is seems to be one of those hormones that's really hard to get tested in women for some reason. Like people just don't like to test them, um, which sucks because it does play a vital role in so many different functionings in our body. Um, and it's very hard to get it prescribed as well, which again, really sucks. We'll talk about a little bit more about what to do at the end of this. Then we have my favorite topic, cortisol, right? Stress hormones are going to be the most important factor for determining digestive health. I'm going to say that again. Stress hormones, aka cortisol, are going to be the most important factor in determining digestive health. So I'm sure you've experienced digestive issues when you're nervous or upset about something. And here is why. When we are in fight or flight, so we have the stress response, cortisol goes up, blood flow goes away from our gut and our digestive system and goes to the other parts of our body for survival. So like our brain, our heart, right? Our heart rate starts to go up. Um, it'll go to our arms and legs because we're preparing to fight the bear or run away from the bear because we're in this fight or flight state, even though you might not think you are, but you are. Um, and then what happens is now we have less blood flow in our gut and digestion in the upper tract is going to slow down when your stress is high, but it's going to speed up in the lower tract. So this can result in not only indigestion, but for some diarrhea. So this is what I like to call stress poops. So if you are in a very stressed state or like in a panic, so I'll give an example of the first time my mom went in for, um, for chemo and they were teaching me how to flush her lines, her port. So I could do that for her so that she wouldn't have to get on a bus and go to the, go to the hospital. Cause she couldn't drive. She didn't have a car. Um, we didn't have the means for like a lot of different things. She had just started a new job, so she didn't have the health insurance, um, so I had to take on some of those roles. So I went to the hospital with her and they were teaching me to flush her lines. And I remember just sitting there and like, I can handle blood well, I can handle 
like fight or flight type situations when it comes to like health and stuff, like the amount of people that have helped in gyms and stuff that have dislocated something, broken something, had to do some first aid that stuff, like that stuff doesn't bother me. But I remember sitting in this chair while this nurse was showing me how to flush my mom's port. So basically she like showed me how to like get the syringe ready with the saline, put it in, you'd push a little bit and then you'd draw it back to make sure um, you were in like the bloodline, there was no clotting. So then some blood would come into the syringe and then you'd push all the saline into it. And I just remember sitting there and I was good, I was good, I was good until I was not. And then all of a sudden, I don't know if it just hit me that it's like, holy crap, that's my mom's blood or like it just made the whole process of cancer and treatment more real or whatever. But I had the most aggressive fight or flight response I have ever had, like physiologically, physically speaking. Um, emotionally I felt fine. My body was not okay. So what happened was instantly I was like drenched in sweat. Um, and like my mom looked at me and she's like, are you okay? I'm like, I'm fine. She's like, you've lost all your color. And, um, I immediately was like a little bit lightheaded. I'm like, I need to go to the bathroom. And I kid you not, I like thought I was going to poop my pants. It was like the most wildest thing for me ever. I came back, they gave me the juice box, they gave me the granola bar, they got me to sit down, which is like, I was embarrassed because like this is stuff I used to help people with at the gym when they would have like injuries or go into shock or things like that. Um, And so like for me, it was like, that was my first big like, I can't control what my body is responding to, even though in my mind I'm fine. I'm like, this is medical. This is fine. This is like my jam. This is what I do. But for me, like my internal system went into fight or flight despite me not knowing it. And that's like a very extreme case, but this is what can happen. And you think you're handling it well, and you think you're, you're doing good and you've had worse before. And like, I mean, we had trauma growing up with like my dad being abusive physically, emotionally, like bullying, all these things that I had gone through that I would consider trauma. And like that situation, I would not consider stressful to myself, but my body was like, "Mm, fight or flight. Here we go. This is happening. Um, so this is why I always tell people like, yes, it's an extreme example, but you might think you're handling things well and your body's doing something completely different for you. Um, but again, this can be, so this whole digestive issue where like you go into fight or flight and, upper tract slows down. So you might start experiencing lots of bloating, discomfort, indigestion, or you might have like, I need to go eliminate now it's happening. I'm pooping. Um, so you can see for someone who is always in a high stress response, this can be a huge issue. You can be either having the runs or you can be constipated, super bloated, and the bloating will get worse throughout the day. And obviously it's going to be harder to want to eat or do things because you're more bloated right? You're not comfortable. So this is where we need to adjust how you're eating and what you're eating to help get those calories in to help negate this fight or flight response, um, which will then actually help with the bloating. But we need to figure out how to do that first. And everyone will be a little bit different. So if your body is constantly in a stressful state and your cortisol levels stay high, chronic problems with digestive system will happen. Over time, this can develop into some serious issues like IBS, IBD, GERD, Crohn's, even hiatal hernias. Um, There are lots of things that can happen when we're in this high stress state that are going to negatively impact our gut health, which will take longer to address. This is why being so proactive is important. This is why I always encourage people to share this with people who might not be going through perimenopause and menopause just yet, because if you can be proactive with this stuff, it'll make that transition so much easier for you. Then we also have to talk about how stress negatively affects gut motility. So how well your intestines can contract and relax to help push things through your digestive system. So in some cases, constipation can occur, meaning the system is just not able to get rid of waste. It just stays there. Or in other cases, we can have diarrhea that lasts longer than the initial stress response. Um, And again, this is all very variable depending on how much stress you have, as well as like, are you doing a ton of exercise? Are you eating enough food? Are you having enough carbohydrates? So there's a lot of like, it depends in this, but the whole point I'm trying to get across here is stress can drastically affect your ability to digest foods and cause bloating. And when your digestive system does not work properly, it can result in nutrient malabsorption, which can lead to nutrient deficiencies. So this is where we see people who 
whatever. Let's just say they're low in, I don't know, vitamin D, for example. Let's just give that example. And they're supplementing, 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 supplementing. No changes, no changes, no changes. It can be because of what's going on in your gut and your body just isn't able to absorb it as well because of the chaos we have going on there. And when we have all these gut health issues and nutrition, um, nutrient deficiencies, it can cause metabolism to slow down, aka your body starts burning less calories at rest, making it much harder to lose weight. And again, these are things that we see incredibly common during perimenopause and menopause because when we see estrogen go down, when we see progesterone go down, it's a lot easier for that stress response to come up because estrogen really helps keep that buffer. It brings cortisol down. So then when we don't have that hormone buffer, it takes a lot less to have that same stress response. So now you're like, I haven't changed anything. And all of a sudden I'm having more bloating. I'm more constipated. I have the runs more and I didn't change anything. Yes, but your hormones changed. So your threshold was lower and now your regular amount of stress that you could handle is above that threshold, causing all of these issues. It's also important to note that this chronically high cortisol response or being stressed all the time is also going to lead to inflammation in your intestinal cells. Um, these are called epithelial cells if you want to know the fancy word for them. But normally these intestinal um, epithelial linings are going to function like a barrier. So they really stop the passage of toxins, antigens, um, harmful bacteria, all those kinds of things from entering the body through the gut. And this also blocks pathogens from entering into our bloodstream. When we are in a state of chronic stress, um, the production of some of these stress hormones by our brain are directly going to affect our intestinal lining because it's going to do what we call increase its permeability. So make it a lot easier for particles that aren't supposed to pass through that barrier in our gut to actually pass through, which has led to what we like to call leaky gut um, or epithelial permeability, permeability, which is like the sciencey term for it now. 20 years ago, when people were talking about leaky gut, everyone was like, oh, you're crazy. That's so ridiculous. Like, you know, you're talking in like, you hear stories, like Sal talked about this when he was on my podcast from Mind Pump, how he worked in a clinic and there was a, a therapist who was also a nutritionist and she was talking about this leaky gut and he worked right close to a hospital. So he trained a lot of doctors and a lot of the doctors were like, oh, that's, that's not a thing. That's not real. Boom. 25 years later, now it's called epithelial permeability. So it takes a long time for these things to make it into research because there has to be enough people chattering about it, making a, you know, making a, making noise about it for researchers to go, oh, this is actually something we should research. Or maybe it's, you know, someone who is 15, 16, their parents start really like working in nutrition or something like that. And then they get inspired to do it. So then, then they go to university and they do the studies. But then those studies, once they're published, you need X amount of studies before they can do like a big meta analysis, which is a study of all the studies before that stuff gets taught in schools, let alone gets put into medical practice. So the things that we're seeing now and talking about now, they won't be put into like regular, realistic Western medicine for another 25 years. And I don't want people to wait that long because that's that's not great right? Like if you're 55, 60, do you really want to wait till you're 75, 80, 85 for the doctor to finally catch up to what we're talking about? No. So um, with this leaky gut that we're talking about here, you have this, this constant inflammation is happening. It sends that stress hormone. It actually like makes the lining more permeable. So more things can pass through it, but then you're going to see more and more inflammation from that. And it's just going to like, make that worse and worse and worse is the more inflammation you have, the more stress you have um, in your body. That stress response is going to signal your brain to send that stress hormone to change the lining of your gut. That's going to lead to more inflammation. You can see how there's just a cycle that keeps going and going and going. And if the cycle is not broken, if we don't address it, then that can actually lead to autoimmune condition development, um, which again, nobody wants because that's makes things even more challenging. So you want to catch things before you get to that point. Stress also has a direct effect on the gut microbiome, like I mentioned. So that's all the bacteria, the balance of the good and the bad bacteria in our gut. And it causes that imbalance. So as much of the good bacteria is wiped out by the 
nervous system, that stress response and that sympathetic nervous system, your fight or flight. And it's important to note that the gut microbiome plays a huge role in our immune system. So the gut mucosal immune system, so the immune system in our gut, acts as a protective barrier to our intestinal tract to keep it nice and healthy. If there are pathogens and other bacteria that are not so good present in the gut microbiome, or we don't have enough good bacteria to counteract that, it can lead to immune system issues, um, more inflammation, and or the development or exasperation of chronic conditions. So this is things like, you know, um, it can actually make like diabetes worse, blood sugar control worse. It can make cardiovascular disease worse. Like there's so many things that are our body and this inflammatory response that we get from our gut can impact everything. And I think the gut health is so, so overlooked and understanding how hormones affect gut health is super overlooked. And the system is super complicated. There is a lot of research going into this because, I mean, we know the way we think affects our gut and our hormone response affects our gut. Our food affects our gut. Inflammation affects our gut. Like there's a lot of things that are going to influence this. Um, it's not just pre and probiotics. Like there's so much more, um, supplements aren't always going to fix everything. Like there's, it goes again, it's just complicated. So I'm trying to do my best to explain the hormone aspect things to you, because I think everyone talks about fiber and prebiotics and probiotics, but the hormone and stress piece is something that's really big and missing. And you can take all the supplements you want, but if you're not addressing these things, the underlying issue is still happening and you're not going to get anywhere. Um, okay. So next I want to talk about our happy gut hormones. So we talked about the things that are super negative for our, our gut. Let's talk about the good stuff. Um, it's important to know that there's good hormones that we want that can contribute to both good digestion as well as positive mood, mental health, and metabolism. So serotonin is considered one of your happy hormones. It's responsible in most people for giving people feelings of ease, happiness, joy, and this is a neurotransmitter and it is produced 94% in the gut. 94%. So 94% of your happy is in your gut. That's, that's what we're saying here. Unfortunately, high levels of stress and cortisol can blunt serotonin production. So you're going to have less of that 94% being produced in there. Inversely, low levels of serotonin from poor gut health or other disorders can cause cortisol to go up higher. So cortisol can bring down your happy hormone, but if you don't have enough happy hormone, then you're going to have more cortisol. So this is clearly an issue. And if you think serotonin might be a contributing factor, eating foods high in the amino acids tryptophan relative to other amino acids can really help. So some examples of this are turkey, canned tuna, apples, bananas, oats, um, or you can eat direct food sources of serotonin. And this is kiwi, pineapple, tomato, and potato. If you want to be happy, <laughs> you need more serotonin in your life because your gut health is all over the place and you're getting 94% is being produced in your gut, eat more potatoes. End of story. If that's the only thing that you get from this episode today, I'll be super happy. Eat your carbs, eat your potatoes. Um, I think it's really interesting to note that direct foods, those force, blah, 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 sorry, that direct food sources of serotonin are all carbs, kiwi, pineapple, tomato, potato. Amazing. So if you want to be happy, have potatoes. I could end the podcast right here, but I got more to cover. So the next one are so that's hormones that affect digestion. So how the gut actually functions. Next, I want to talk about hormones that affect weight fluctuations. Okay, so first we have cortisol. So cortisol, we know, of course, it's going to make its way in here. We always talk about it, but high cortisol levels in the liver not only slow down your liver's, liver's avail... Oh my goodness, let's just start that over. I am so sorry, you guys. Deep breath, stuff. High cortisol levels in the liver not only slow down liver's ability to detox their hormones and substances, but it encourages a process in our body called gluconeogenesis. This is the process in our body that converts other simple compounds and amino acids into sugar for energy. So having a body that is constantly converting amino acids, um, oh my gosh, 
amino acids, which are proteins, into sugar is going to cause, oh my goodness, Steph. Okay, let's start this over. Having a body that's constantly converting amino acids, so aka protein, into sugars because of stress not only creates a higher blood sugar response, but the rapid breakdown of muscle. So let me say that again, because people are so concerned with carbohydrates and they think carbs are what's always increasing your um, blood sugar, but stress, 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 you guys, stress is increasing your blood sugar. I talked about this in a past podcast, maybe three or four episodes ago, but having a body that is stressed is going to cause your liver to convert proteins into sugars because you are stressed, which is going to increase your blood sugars. Okay. And then if we're not dealing with this can lead to insulin resistance down the road, potentially prediabetes and diabetes and slow down your metabolism as well. And it's going to cause your body to break down muscle mass. So this is why when people don't take stress seriously enough, it drives me bonkers. So we need to eat enough food. We need to eat enough carbs. We need to eat enough protein. We need to exercise the right way. We need to sleep. We need to be having good energy, improving our gut health. All of these things are going to help bring that stress response down in your body to help your metabolism so that you're not dealing with these things. Okay. We know that a loss of muscle and a higher propensity for high glucose. So if we're having more blood, sh- our blood sugars be higher and we're losing muscle mass because of the stress process that I just talked about, we know it's going to make your body more likely to store sugars as fat because if you're losing muscle mass, you have less muscle cells for your sugar to go into. So your body is therefore going to store it as fat. Muscle loss and weight gain is what's happening. So you might feel like maybe you're losing weight. Maybe the scale is going down. You're like, I don't look any different. I feel like I'm fluffier. I don't feel like I look fit. I don't feel like I look toned. This is because the scale might be going down, but you're losing muscle and gaining fats or the scale is staying the same. Your body composition is getting worse. And this is not a good sign because we know that during perimenopause and menopause, when estrogen goes down, and if you're struggling with low testosterone as well, you are also going to be at a predisposition to lose muscle mass. Same when you're doing a ton of cardio, Same when you're eating a low carb diet and a low calorie diet. So all the things that you were doing to try and lose weight are actually really focusing on decreasing muscle mass and then fat mass might stay the same or increase. Then you actually have a higher body fat percentage, which I'm sure is not what you're trying to accomplish with what you're doing right now. So it's also important to be aware that cortisol also works to stimulate your fat and carb metabolism, which will affect your hunger hormones, leading to more cravings for sweets or big meals. And you're also going to feel like you have less willpower. So it isn't just that you don't mentally have willpower, your hormones and body are almost kind of working against you, if that kind of makes sense to counteract what you're doing because your body is too stressed and it knows that you need more food. Then we have our thyroid. So thyroid is the backbone of our metabolism. Low thyroid function means low thyroid hormone, which will lead to a depressed metabolic state. So that means your body gets worse at burning calories. You're also going to be more tired. A lower um, metabolism or your body just not burning calories well paired with having low energy is going to cause unintentional unintentional weight gain and a harder time losing weight because if you are exhausted, it makes it very hard to want to meal prep. If I'm exhausted, my brain goes, I'd rather have pizza than some carrots. Like logically, that makes sense. I would rather sleep than work out, right? Like it's, it makes it a lot harder. And then if your body's already struggling with burning calories, of course you're going to struggle with your weight. Low thyroid function has also been shown to cause weight fluctuations in the scale with its association to impaired recovery and increased inflammation in your body. So this can cause improper fluid and electrolyte balance, which means people who have a thyroid that's not working as well or lower thyroid function can definitely see more drastic scale fluctuations as our body just isn't as good as at balancing out the electrolytes and the fluids and things like that. So this is why I always encourage people either never weigh yourself, especially if it's going to like divert you off of your plan 
or weigh yourself every day and take an average of the week because for, especially if you have thyroid issues, you're going to see the scale fluctuate significantly more. So if you only weigh yourself three days a week, but those happen to be the three days a week that your body's holding onto more fluid, you might think that you're not doing so well. Whereas like if you measure every day, you can see the changes, you can see what's normal for your body. Um, and it'll give you a little bit more, um, peace of mind, if you will, of like, okay, my body's fluctuating a lot, but let's look at the trend over time. Take the weekly averages. That's a better indication of how you're doing. Um, it's also important to know, I was actually reading a study this morning. I should have, I should have saved it, um, to put in here, but they were talking about how with thyroid, um, just because you're on the medications, it's not changing the internal processes. So that can help with like energy, for example, but your thyroid isn't actually functioning better. So it's not going to improve your metabolism. Um, it can help with your, your energy for sure, but there's a lot of internal processes that are still, still happening. So it doesn't mean that the medication that you're taking for a low thyroid is going to help you lose weight by any means. It can be great for symptoms, which I think is very important. And I wouldn't say, like, I, this is not me saying don't take your medication. I would never say that. But you need to be aware that depending what your goal is, if it is to improve your metabolism, if it is to improve your body composition, to lose some fat, the medication itself isn't going to be the answer because there's a lot of internal processes that aren't actually addressed by that medication. So just something to be aware of. Next, we have estrogen. Estrogen is a huge contributor to water retention if it's imbalanced. Water retention will cause a drastic fluctuation on the scale from day to day or week to week. If estrogen stays chronically imbalanced, it can also contribute to potential insulin resistance because we know estrogen does a very good job of helping regulate our blood sugars. And it can also lead to fat storage in certain areas of the body, which can lead to fat gain over time. So this is why a lot of people when they're around their period and stuff like that, and they start seeing changes in their estrogen and progesterone levels, start seeing a lot of bloating. So yes, we're going to see a rise and dip in the hormones as we go through our cycle, but it's really trying to manage things as best as we can to improve that because it shouldn't be super drastic and learning how to eat to help support our bodies during those times. Then we have androgens. So androgens are typically considered male hormones, um, but women still have them. If you have PCOS, typically you're going to have higher androgen levels. Um, and they are also a huge contributor to fluid and weight fluctuations when they're not in balance. So when our adrenals are overworking, so AKA we are stressed, it can produce an overcompensation of androgen production like DHEA. When we are, when we are producing a lot of DHEA, we have a higher chance of hyperconverting it to other more potent androgens, which can completely change your body chemistry, which can include fat storage changes, um, excess dark hair growth, even acne. And it can also lead to rapid fat gain and weight gain over a short period of time, i.e. like months, um, even when your calories are controlled. So again, when people say hormones do not pact, impact metabolism and weight gain, I just want to shake them because it absolutely does. Um, it's important to note with androgens, you're typically going to have more inflammation in your body as well. And this is an adrenal problem most of the time. So most of the time when we see this happening, it's because your stress response is too high or it's increased substantially from where it was, or you had your estrogen and progesterone tank too quickly. Um, so now you can't buffer stress as well. There's something going on there. So we need to address our stress response system, which is our HBA access. That's always going to be the first step. Always, always, always. So with this, again, just like the other topics we talked about, it's going to be about eating enough food, making sure you're having enough carbs, you're exercising appropriately. We're focusing on gut health. We're focusing on your sleep, your energy. Very, very important. Okay. So that can also lead to weight fluctuations um, or scale fluctuations. And then we have insulin. Insulin leads to elevated weight gain, fat accumulation in the abdomen, the stomach area, that menopause belly area that we all are just trying to get rid of. Because insulin is a hormone that regulates how our body uses sugar as energy, the body is very sensitive to insulin levels. So when blood sugars are too high for too long, because again, if you're in that stress response, 
your body is going to tell your liver to pump more sugar into your bloodstream. It'll do this by using the protein that you've consumed or whatever food you've had, but protein is one of them to increase your blood sugars or break down muscle mass for energy and turn that into sugars. Okay. So we know that's going to go up and then insulin's going to come in and be like, oh, I need to get rid of these sugars. I need to get rid of these sugars. So it's going to start shuttling sugars and our blood sugar is going to come down. But in stress response, our body's like, no, we need energy. We need energy. And it's going to keep telling your liver, pump out more sugar, pump out more sugar, pump out more sugar. So it's going to keep breaking down muscle mass. It's going to keep pumping sugars into your bloodstream. It's going to make insulin rise again. And eventually your body just stops responding to the insulin, um, insulin trying to move those sugars into other areas of your body. So it's like insulin's just knocking on doors and knocking on doors and knocking on doors to try and get the door to open to push those sugars in. But eventually your body's like, uh, it's just like kind of background noise. It's white noise now. Don't answer the door anymore. So then your body starts shuttling it to, um, fat cells. And then we see that with these high insulin levels we, and insulin resistance, it can actually inhibit the breakdown of fat, which can also lead to more weight loss resistance. And the solution again is not cutting carbs. Pairing foods with carbs to balance blood sugars and still elicit adequate insulin levels paired with exercise is the best way to balance insulin levels, okay? Because we know if we're not having carbs, that stress response is going to be higher and our body is going to take whatever food you have eaten, even if it's just protein, to convert that into sugar and raise your blood sugars. So understanding this aspect of things, it's very important Because once you understand this, A, you won't be afraid of food anymore. We know that potatoes are great for us and they're a carb and they create serotonin, which makes us happy. It's going to help lower our stress response. White potatoes and sweet potatoes, one is not more superior than the other. I've actually seen a lot of women who have like continuous glucose monitors who, when they have sweet potato, have a higher blood sugar response than white potato. So I don't know where this, this thing is of one is better for you than the other. They're not. Um, You can have both. It's fine. But understanding that this will also lead to weight fluctuations if you are not having the carbs, if you are becoming more insulin resistant and breaking down muscle, these are all these things are going to really contribute to changes in your body composition. And with perimenopause and menopause, we know, like studies show that your body can't break down fats as well. We have a much harder time accessing energy stores. Fat loss is going to be slower. So you don't want to do anything that is going to, you know, push you in the wrong direction and dig that hole deeper and deeper and deeper that you need to come out of. Because unfortunately, what we've been taught from the health and fitness space of eat less, move more, do a bunch of cardio, cut your carbs, cut your calories, stay there forever. It's negatively affected your metabolism. And then your body's already not functioning well. It's already not being able to break down um, fat mass well. It's not able to utilize that. And then we go into perimenopause and menopause and it gets worse. So learning how to improve this before you get to that point is incredibly important. So share that information with anyone who's younger and not quite there yet so they can really understand how to have a smoother transition once they get there. Um, But then also understanding that this is the way to actually heal things. This is the way to improve your metabolism. If we don't do these things, like you're, you're going to just continue to yo-yo back and forth, back and forth, going from eating like a rabbit to giving up and then gaining weight because your metabolism is slow, but you go back to eating quote unquote normal. And we have to break this cycle because it's making us miserable. It's making us exhausted. It's making us gain weight. It's affecting our hormones, our mood, our relationships with others and ourselves, our self-talk, the way we show up for our families at work. And at some point it's like, where, when is enough enough? Like I talk to women and, you know, I give them the advice. I give them the information. I give them their calories, all those things. And then they talk to me a year later and like, oh, I'm still in the same spot. I'm like, hey, well, have you started doing these things? And they're like, no, I got scared. And it's like, okay, that's fine. My advice is still the same, but now it's probably just going to take you longer to get to you to where you want to be. Um, but it's like how we don't change 
until the pain that we're in is worse than the pain of changing or the fear of changing. So it's like, how much pain do you have to put yourself through before you decide enough is enough and you start making the changes? Because you might feel like you're doing okay now, but like eventually things change. And I talk to women about this. Like I was good. I was good. And I thought I was fine. I was the exception. And then it's last August. I don't know what happened. My body just feels like it went against me. And for a lot of women, it is like that. Like they feel like they're doing fine. They feel like they're good. Or they talk to their women like, no, that'll never be me. That'll never happen to me. And they get there. So making these small changes slowly over time will be very, very key. So now we need to talk about that pesky number on the scale before we get to the end of this podcast, because it's very important to understand that the number on the scale should not be your only metric of progress especially because we want to see, especially since we can see that so many different hormones and your body, there's so many things that can happen to really affect your weight fluctuations day to day. Hormone wise, food wise, gut health wise, bloating, right? Like there's so many different things that are going to influence this. Um, And it happens to everyone. So there are actually more reasons than the number on the scale may show that cause those fluctuations that we haven't talked about. Like there's salt, um, there's water fluctuations, how much you've drank in a day. Like there's so many things I'm going to briefly touch on a few of those here. And I almost want all of you to have that checklist for when you hop on a scale and you see it go up and you panic, do the checklist. What could be causing this fluctuation? Because you're not going to gain three pounds of fat overnight. That's going to be water. Okay. And this is going to happen to everyone. Um, And even though you've seen it before and I've seen it before, it still happens. And it can be super frustrating to see that number jumping around. Like I always tell stories where I'm like, you know, I felt so good. I felt so lean. And I'm like, dang, I look so good today. And then I hop on the scale and I'm upset because it doesn't reflect the way that I feel or the way that I think I look. So I let that number dictate my emotion more than how I feel about myself when I'm looking in the mirror. And that's messed up. Okay, so it's important to know that weight is not a good indicator of progress on its own because it doesn't account for body composition changes. You don't know if you're putting on muscle mass, if you're losing fat, if it's water. We don't know any of those things, okay? Typically, when we start a health and fitness journey, our body composition really does start to change, meaning that even if our weight stays the same, we can see changes in fat mass going down, muscle mass going up, being more toned, less bloated, That's all progress, but we let one single indicator dictate our happiness. That would be like me picking a random stranger on the street who knows nothing about me, asking them for their opinion of me, and then letting that dictate my self-worth for the entire day and then repeating that the next day. That's what you're doing with the scale. Would you go up to a stranger and ask them what they thought about yourself, thought about you, and then you let that dictate the rest of your day, whether you choose to eat or not? to be happy or not. No. So stop doing that with a stupid little machine. Stop it. So here are some things that can really fluctuate our our weight. And I'm just going to blow through them really quickly here because I don't want you guys to get bored listening to my voice. So the first one is sodium. If you have more sodium one day or less sodium the next, sodium directly goes hand in hand with fluid retention. So how much water your body is holding because water wants to go where salt is. So more salt means more water. Um, if you have lots of less salt one day, you might have a lot less water in your body. So again, that's just water. That's not, that's not, uh, not fat. So if you feel like you've had a lot of salt one day and, or you went to the movies and had some salted popcorn or whatever it is, just drink more water the next couple of days and it'll, fl- it'll, it'll flush out. It'll go back to where it normally is after a few days. Not a big deal. The next one is water fluctuations. More water is going to be so good for your health. It's really great for you. However, if you're dehydrated, your body is going to obviously be lighter. Drinking a little bit water, your body might hold on to it more. If you're drinking a lot more water suddenly, scale's obviously going to go up for more water in your body. So again, it takes time for your body to get used to what you're doing. So 
don't panic. And this is not me telling you to not drink water so the scale goes down because that's just water. Your body's not going to function properly and then you're going to end up gaining weight anyways. Carbs, 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 carbs. It takes one gram, one gram of carb needs three to four grams of water to digest. So let's say you slowly start increasing your carb intake, your body's going to hold on to more water in the digestive process to break those carbs down compared to fats or proteins. This is why when you do a low carb diet, you see the scale drop down so fast because you've lost so much water weight because of the digestive process. That's it. It's not fat. Carbs are not responsible for weight gain. That's not what's happening here. The next one is that you haven't pooped. Pretty self-explanatory. If you're backed up, scale is probably going to be higher. If you worked out harder than usual. So when you work out harder, your body's going to hold on to a little bit more water, a little bit more inflammation to help your body repair and build more muscle, which is what you want. So if you work out really hard one day, the next day the scale might go up a little bit and that's normal. If you ate later or more than usual, more food in your digestive system when you weigh yourself in the morning. Again, not fat. If you're stressed, we all know that stress causes a ton of physical issues. Water retention and inflammation are just one of them. So if you're in a stressful time, you will see the scale go up in water retention and it can stay elevated for two weeks post. So it's really important to be aware that just because you feel better when you're not sick anymore, for example, your body's still going to hold on to water and inflammation for up to two weeks later because it takes time for your body to adjust. Alcohol. Alcohol, blah, blah, blah. Alcohol dehydrates you in the moment, but causes water retention for two to three days post. So two to three days post after having one or two drinks of alcohol will cause the scale to go up. So if you're having alcohol regularly throughout the week, um, you are going to see the scale just stays up because your body just holds onto water. Um, keep in mind, alcohol also slows down your metabolism, makes your body worse at burning calories. So that is something else to consider. If you are sick or recovering, like I said, you can have more water retention for a few days or for like a week or so post because your body is working on fighting things. Your cortisol levels go up, which is again, going to hold on to water fluid in inflammation. Certain medications like some antidepressants, steroids, some allergy medications, even birth control, they can cause water retention as well and cause the scale to fluctuate. Um, keep in mind about that if you're changing any dosages and things like that as well, or if you forget to forget to um, take them one day, for example. And those are just a few. Like there are so many reasons aside from hormones and what I listed in terms of what can cause weight fluctuations, um, changes in digestion, things like that. Um, so in conclusion, the number on the scale cannot be the only thing that you are paying attention to during fat loss. Okay. We need to pay attention to everything. It's important to note that your hormones will directly affect your digestive ability, ab digestive abilities. It will also uh, contribute to bloating as well as those other factors that I listed. So in order to help those hormonal balances, we have guides for pretty much every single hormone that we have talked about at this point. Um, there's also a podcast on like every single hormone that we've talked about up until this point as well. So you can search through them. But if you just want someone to help you figure things out, if you have been tested, if you have questions, if you feel like this is you and you're struggling with the bloating and the digestion, again, sometimes you don't need all these fancy gut health things and supplements a lot of the time, it's just we need to take stress off your system so your hormone balance can improve, so we can decrease your inflammation and improve your blood sugars, and then you'll be on your way. We have so many women that improve their digestion, improve their bloating just by eating more food, okay? Um, that being said, be careful with increasing foods. You got to do it slowly. So if you want to figure out what that looks like for you, just message me again. I'm always happy to do that for you. I hope this gave you some peace of mind that you're not crazy. Things are changing during perimenopause and menopause, digestion and bloating and fluid retention included. So just, again, I hope that brings you comfort. If you want help figuring out what you should be doing, particularly with gut health things, just message me. I'm always happy to help. First line of defense is always going to be stress management. 
I hope this was helpful. Have a great rest of your day and I'll talk to you soon. Bye.